Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 23rd, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and gals for attended, attending today. I'm humbled by your presence, so thank you so much. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, hold off on your stock picks until we get to the charts, and that's for your benefit to make sure I don't overlook them if they're mixed in with the other questions. And once we do get to the live charts, that is, and I'll let you know when that is, uh, ask about one stock at a time, and that's just for your benefit so I can make sure I cover your stock or your stock. So if you have more than one, just hit enter every time you put a ticker symbol in. I know a lot of tickers, but I don't know all of them, so you might have to give me a hint and give me the ticker on them. So what are we talking about? Well, last week I forgot to hit the record button, and I do have a habit of bringing things public maybe a little too early, so I was able to flesh out a little work from last week's presentation. But today's presentation is recorded, and I'm going to follow up on timing the market with simple systems, and more specifically, one specific simple system. But I will show you a couple things. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, borrowing a line from my buddy Greg Morris, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So let's talk about timing the market with simple systems. When I developed bow ties and started looking at the weekly bow ties, I noticed that it did a really good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. And one thing by accident, I just happened to have the 50 period moving average plotted on a weekly chart. So that'd be a 50 week moving average as I have plotted here. And one thing I noticed, as simple as bow ties are, something even simpler would be looking at the daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, or as I now call it, day light, and staying long as long as the there was upside daylight and staying short as long as there was downside daylight. Now, it's nothing perfect, perfect about this system, and it's not a red light, green light. But as you can see, looking back the last 20-something years, your bear markets have mostly downside Dave Light, and your bull markets have mostly upside Dave Lights, Dave Light. And there's occasionally a little corrections in between, and not every correction turns into the mother of all bear markets, but it's probably a good idea to get out of the way when that happens. Now, as I often preach, technical analysis has a hard and fast concrete rule, but no other methodologies, such as fundamentals, I know I just said the F word, have such a rule. You can't say, I'm going to buy a market when the PE is this and sell it when it's that. By the way, the most popular fundamental indicator, or whatever you want to call it, in the world, has price as its Numerator, isn't that ironic, don't you think? But if the market's going from A to C, and let's say A is five bucks and C is twenty bucks, and B is somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through B on its way to C. That's just simple mathematics. Now you can't always just buy at B, although I am watching an IPO, and if it closes at a certain level today, I will be buying it. But for the most part, you'd be a lot better off looking to buy somewhere around B than fighting the trend. In other words, you're much better off looking to trade with the trend. Now, let's say a market's going from A to C and it passes through B along the way. But let's say it also ends up making a round trip, goes all the way back to A. So let's say it goes from 5 to 10 to 20, and then begins to implode and goes all the way back down to 5. 
Well, it will have to pass back through B on the way down. So my premise is, why not stay along a market as long as the market is near C? So again, stay long as long as the market is near C. So in this particular case, you can see from A to B to C, if it's going to go to beyond C, not beyond C, beyond C, then you probably want to stay long as long as it's near C. So if it is going to keep going past C, then why not stay long as long as it's near C? And if it is going to make a round trip, it's going to have to drop below near C on its way to B and back to A. So exit the market if it drops below this level. Now this level depends on the market. As you'll see in one second, we're using 10% for the market, for the overall market. And I think that's a pretty good round number. All right, so let's talk about Dave Landry's a TFM simplest system in the world. Now, before we get into that, when you're designing a system, here's my approach to it. First and foremost, keep it simple. As I've said ad nauseum, I spent many years doing a lot of programming and actually did some consulting programming where I program systems for others. And then I would do my research in the meantime. And I got more and more and more and more complex. And that true enlightenment thing I often talk about is when I began peeling away all those extraneous indicators and then got back to focus mostly on price. And, well, focus on price with the occasional moving average. Now, keep in mind, when you are designing a system, everything works better with trend. A lot of system designers were born in the late 90s, and they showed you these incredible trend-following systems. In fact, even after 2000, in the middle of the bear market, they showed you all these great systems. Well, they weren't great. They were so great because we had a long bull market preceding it. So keep in mind, everything works better with trend. I've seen some people do some amazing things with complex methodologies, such as wave counting, but when the trend turns and the complex methodology is no longer in sync with that longer term trend, then it no longer works and people get into a lot of trouble. They think they have the holy grail, but quite simply, they just caught the right side of the trend. And without digressing too far, as I say over and over, I'll be in a presentation where you'll have a chart and you'll have buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, maybe even a hundred of these buys and sells. But if you look at something as simple as a moving average and something as simple as moving average Dave Light would have avoided all those signals and maybe you just have one buy and one sell. So as I often say, simple, complex systems can often be boiled down to much simpler systems. Now, Keep in mind that a simpler system is easier to understand, follow, and will more than likely be robust longer term. And that's because there's much less of a chance of curve fitting. Now, when you're designing a system, and as I've said quite a bit, I told the system designer once that if you're designing a system in perfect hindsight, okay, then your biggest drawdown will always be in front of you. So you've got to be very careful. And he actually got very angry with me when I said that. Well, you don't know what the future brings, so you have to embrace that. And you have to be careful, again, because you've, everything's in hindsight. You could have possibly curved fit the data. Now, this is unavoidable. Whipsaws are just simply unavoidable. Early in my grail hunting, system developing, programming days, I used to work really, really, really hard to figure out how to avoid all those whipsaws. Well, like death 
and taxes, they're just unavoidable. And I think it's okay to put in a little filter, something really simple to possibly keep you from having so many signals. Maybe reduce the amount of signals and have a little bit of additional qualification, or if you want to call it quantification, that's fine. I guess quantification to keep you from in and out, in and out when the market begins to chop around. Now, as I've said quite often, Greg Morris visited a few years back, and you always get something good out of Greg. And we started talking about bear markets and their severity, its systems and choppy markets and whipsaws and everything like that. And he said, well, whipsaws, as you know, are unavoidable. And then he went on to say, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. So you possibly want to consider some sort of trend filter, and I'll show you an idea for one, which I used in this little simple system. But you want to make sure you're keeping that simple, too. Now, here's my, and I had the word nearly here right before I went live, because there are a few rules to it. I suppose you could say, well, we're just going to buy if we have upside daylight and sell, if we have downside daylight, similar to the chart I showed earlier. But we're going to add in a couple little rules here. So for a buy, and this is the whipsaw filter, you want to buy when two lows are greater than the 50-week moving average. Now, to those of you who are familiar with the 220 EMA breakout system, this is pretty much very similar to that. You want to buy the 220 EMA breakout system said, okay, this is your trend filter, then you want to buy above this. Well, this is just going to buy when the market has two lows that are greater than the 50-week moving average and the market is near C. So let's say your high is here and you're within 10% of that high, which I'll show you in one second. And let's say the market is here and you have two lows greater than the moving average, then that's your buy. That's it. That's a whole system. Now, it's going to make a lot of sense once we get to that. Now, you want to stay long as long as the market is near C, and then I put adjusted for the market's volatility. Now, this isn't an ongoing adjustment, okay? Again, we're going to keep it simple. So for the S&P 500, we're just going to use a fixed 10% number. So if the market is 10% or more off its old highs, you exit. If it's less than 10% away from its old highs, you look to either stay long or get in. And you want to sell or sell short when the market is greater than 10% away from C, okay, A, B, C. So if it's on its way back down and it's greater than 10% or more, you want to exit provided that it also closes below the 50-week moving average. So we're looking to get out a little bit more quickly because in general they slide faster than they glide. And a pilot once said, well, a glide actually goes down, but just work with me on that. Glide means they're actually slowly ascending and slide means the market's imploding. So let's look at the actual rules. So as you can see here, I have a line, a fixed line drawn at 10%. So right here, and we're using a 50-week high, okay, and this is a 50-week moving average. So if the market is greater than 10% away from the 50-week moving average, I'm sorry, from, so let me rewind that. If the market is greater than 10% away from its 50-week high, in other words, it's 10% or more away from 
C, then you want to be out of the market and possibly short, as we'll see in a few examples. Now, notice what happens when the market begins to drop below that number. In other words, the market begins to climb, so it's closing the gap. Let's say the 50-week highs are here. Well, as it begins to rally, it begins to close that gap. As you can see now, it's less than 10% away, so we're going to look to buy. And the only caveat that we're going to add in is that we have to have two bars of daylight, and then we buy. So if you look at this little ribbon I program down here, it's going to stay bearish as long as there's downside day of light and the market is 10% or greater away from its 50-week high. And it's going to go neutral when it's less than 10% away. So again, here's your buy. One bar of daylight. You kind of have to squint your eyes to see it. Two bars of Dave light. And then you can see the day of light continuing, and this trend slowly began to work its way higher. But notice up here, and this won't always happen, but notice up here that it stayed below 10% for a long time. Now, whenever you test a system, you really have to play devil's advocate and sort of stress test that system, so to speak. So I like to go look at really bad and ugly market conditions. And I also like to look at choppy conditions too to see if that trend filter helps you out at all. So as you can see here, and this is going back to 1929, 1930. I think we all know what happened then. I'm not quite that old, but I'm, I have historical charts. So you can see that the market began to sell off right here, and we were now 10% below, or the sell-off was greater than 10% away from the 50-week high. And the market closed below its 50-week. This is just a simple moving average. So what you want to do is you want to exit. Now, when you are trend following, sometimes markets go up, they correct, they go up, they correct, they go up, they correct, they go up, and then they top. Well, you have to be willing to give up some of your gains during these corrections because you don't know when the market's going to continue higher or if that correction might be the start of something bigger. So what we're going to do is we're going to exit if it's more than 10% away from its 50-week high, and the close goes below its moving average. Initially, I was just thinking, let's exit when you're 10% away from highs, but that does seem to create a little bit more whipsaw. Now, keep in mind, there's always a trade-off. So let's say we're going to exit at 10% and not wait for that moving average to get hit, okay? Well, you might get out a little bit early, and it might just turn around and go right back up. So you might have got whipsawed on that. Now, if you wait for it to close below the moving average, you're going to give up more of that trend. So there's always a trade-off in trading. I guess that's why they call it trading. Now, let's take a look at the crash, or sorry, let's take a look at what happened after that sell signal. Now, that might have seemed like a lot of trend to give up in the end, but keep in mind, this was a pretty good run back here. And yeah, you gave up some in the end. But then this market continued to drop, and this was back in the 30s. And from the sell signal day, or I should say week, down to the low, the market lost 83% of its value. So you would have avoided losing 83% of your money by getting out of the way. Now, let's go take a look at the crash in 1987. So we were less than 10% away from 50-week highs, and I'm going to 
talk about this little whipsaw looking area right here. It's not actually not as bad as it looks once we zoom in. But let's stay focused on this for a second. So you had a buy way back in 1985 and you stayed long for a couple of years based on this simple little system. It amazes me how something so simple can keep you long. So notice that it stayed bullish for a long, long time. And then what happens in October of 1987? Well, you had, again, this really long, long trend leading up to it with a lot of Dave light. And you bought way down here, okay? The market begins to sell off pretty hard. I remember that Friday was pretty ugly. I wasn't, I wasn't actively trading. I think I was just out of school at the time or getting out of school. But I do remember that Friday and the market sold off so hard, it was more than 10% away from its 50-week high and it closed below the 50-week moving average. So that would have been your exit signal. And then the following Monday, the market lost another 34%. Now, it did bottom out. But there was no guarantee at the time or any time when a market is low that it won't continue to go lower. One of my little quirky bad English adages is that it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. An example I often use is the NASDAQ was down 50% in 2000 and then it lost another 30% of its value. So if you'd have tried to buy at a 50% haircut thinking that oh it's uh half off right how much lower can it go well a lot lower there was a famous trader who's known as a value guy like oh golly gee shucks i just do these simple little things in markets i buy value well come to find out he sold a whole bunch of puts in the 2008 bottom and he looked like a genius because he was buying value, so to speak. Well, if the market would have dropped, like the NASDAQ dropped in 2000, another 30%, he could have decimated his fund. Now, I don't know how big his positions were, but when you're selling puts, your risk are open-ended. Keep the questions coming. I'm going to get to those, uh, Frenchie. Keep them coming. So let's take a look at this particular example here. And this is what the aforementioned whipsaw was talking about. So notice that going into the mid-80s, you had a longer-term downtrend in the market, and you had downside Dave Light. And you can see right here, you were less than 10% away from 50-week highs. But we've added in that little trend filter. We don't want to buy until we have some sort of confirma confirmation in the trend filter. And that confirmation comes right here when you are, A, less than 10% away from the 50-week high, and, B, you have at least two bars one, two of Dave Light. Now, so you had a pretty good run where it stayed below 10% for a long, long time, roughly about a year or so, maybe even a little bit longer than that, year and three months. And then you could see the market began to lose momentum and trade sideways. And eventually, it was over 10% away from its 50-week high. And it, it was also already below its 50-day, I'm sorry, 50-week moving average. So then you want to exit. Now, because we've got that little trend filter in here, when the market gets within 10% of its high, we're not going to buy it because we also want to see some improvement in price. And we want at least two bars above the 50-week moving average. So your buy would have been over here. Now, even though you gave up, rewinding this a little bit, even though you gave up 
quite a bit of your trend on a net net basis, you did okay, better than a poke in the eye. And then, of course, the bear market didn't materialize here, but you got out of the way. As I often preach the old hedge fund adage, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So sometimes you just get out of the way. And again, your buy would be over here. What do we have for a buy? Less than 10% away from highs and two lows greater than the moving average. Now, what's amazing about something as simple as this is it can keep you long for a very long, 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 long time. So you'd have gotten long in the early 90s and stayed long for a long, long, long time, just following this little simple system and staying long as long as you were within 10% of the 50 week highs. And then notice here that you would have gotten to sell way over here 10 years later, or eight years later, I should say, when the market did what? It was more than 10% away from highs and closed below the 50 week moving average. So this is the sell signal here. Notice leading up to it. You had a lot of Dave light. You also had positive slope in the 50-week moving average. And then you sold here. Well, the market turned right back up. So what? Again, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So you would have bought back in. That's a whip straw, whipsaw. It could be frustrating. But at least you avoid bear markets. Now, here we have one more whipsaw right here. And you have another buy. And then another sell signal here. And then another buy. So this was a period where you did get a few whipsaws. But the good news is from here to here, you would have made pretty good money. So that counts. Okay. You would have given up some of your open profits, but you had so much money that you made coming into this, I wouldn't worry about that whipsaw. When I consider what I consider a whipsaw or a serious whipsaw is when you get back to back buys and sells. And you might have either made a little bit or scratched out on this signal here, so that's okay. And then finally on this sell signal here you would have lost a little bit because you would have gotten in here and sold there. I'm sorry, let's fix that. You would have gotten in here and sold here. But so what? And the reason I say so what is because this bear market that started in 2000, the S&P lost over half of its value, and you would have gotten out at fairly high levels. You'd have gotten out in the 1500s, and this market went down to the 700s. So you can see something simple like this will certainly get you out of the way when it gets kind of ugly. And then of course, don't forget to draw your big blue arrows. And then of course, you would have had a buy in 2000 when the market is less than 10% away from its 50 week high. And of course you had upside Dave light. And then that was the beginning of that new trend higher. Now let's fast forward real quick to 2007, 2008, and you'll see that during this very long, long trend going all the way back to 2003, the market was less than 10% away from its 50-week highs. And then what happens all of a sudden right here, you are greater than 10% away from its high. So if this is C... Well, now you are, let's say C's up here, you're here. Well, now you're beginning to drop more than 10% away from C. So now you got to think about exiting, and then you could see, no pun intended, that we are below the 50-week moving average. So it's time to exit the market. Now, we didn't know that the market would once again lose half of its value, but we get out of the way. 
just in case. Now, fast forward to more recent times, you can see you've had some really nice long runs in here. You would have gotten knocked out on a little whipsaw in 2016. And as I preach, the Russell 2000 actually lost 18% of its value back then. So that was nothing to sneeze at. The strict buy and hold people who look like geniuses over the last 10, 15 years or how many years is that? Let's see. It's, uh, yeah, going on, closing in on 10 years. Well, they held through this, which was probably not a very smart thing to do. The problem with trading is the end results aren't always indicative of good decisions. Now, a couple of random thoughts. It does a darn good job of keeping you in major bull markets and out of major bear markets. And as you saw a few minutes ago, there would be long periods where it would be bearish in bear markets and extremely long periods where it'd be bullish in bull markets. And of course, some whipsaw is unavoidable. And of course, some whipsaw is completely unavoidable. Now, like any system, hindsight is 2020. But since it's so simple, the chances of this continuing to work based on the ABC premise, I believe, are pretty good. Now, Frenchie says C looks awfully good. Yes, you want to stay long as long as you're near C because you don't know if it's going to go to Beyonce, or I should say with the hopes that'll go to Beyonce. How do you keep whipsaws or drawdowns to a minimum? Well, you figure that out, Frenchie, and you'll own the world. What I've done here is said, okay, well, we might have like buy and sell signals that look like this. So how do I reduce those whipsaws? Well, the first thing to, to do to reduce whipsaws was to create for the upside, create the Dave light filter saying, okay, well, let's have two weeks where the lows are greater than the moving average. So let's say the moving average does like this and it's like that. Well, if the prices are just chopping around it, let's have at least two, one, two days where it's above, or one, two weeks, I should say, above the 50 week moving average. By the way, you hear me confusing my time periods. And that's because patterns are fractal. What works in one time frame works in other, others. I like the daily charts for stocks. And I like to look at the weekly charts to give me a longer term perspective in the indices. But remember, the longer the chart you're looking at, the more lag you're going to have. The shorter the chart you're looking at, the more whipsaw and noise that you're going to have. So in trading, there's always a trade off. So. Getting back to Frenchie's questions about whipsaw is having some sort of little trend filter will help to reduce your whipsaw, some confirmation. Now, let's say you wanted four bars or five bars of daylight. Well, the problem with that is now you're introducing more and more lag into the system. Now, if the market's going to rally for 10 years, then four or five weeks is no big deal and it would avoid a lot of whipsaw going back unfortunately maybe four or five weeks is all you get before you get stopped out at a loss okay i'm sorry maybe four or five weeks is all you get before you get stopped out at a gain so you would miss that gain and even worse you would be getting in in week four right before the market corrects and stops you out so you could introduce lag by creating too much confirmation. And what's weird is you're thinking like, okay, I'm going to be much safer by introducing a longer term trend filter. Well, the problem is you're going to get in a little later and that could actually increase your drawdowns. And in some case it could actually create some more whipsaw type of signals. Now whipsaw is a signal that is not profitable. So if I if you get in for a short period of time and you get knocked out shortly thereafter for a profit, 
I wouldn't call that exactly whipsaw. I would call that maybe an active signal that didn't really pay off. Okay. So there's no secret to really keeping drawdowns to the minimum other than in this particular case, we're saying that we're going to, for open profits, when it drops below 10% from its highs, let's say we're in a longer term trend. So on those open profits and it closes below the 50 week moving average. So that's gonna stop our losses from growing or I should say, stop our open losses to open profits from growing. Would you sell half at the 10% mark? Well, um, no. Well, all I'm doing here is I'm testing a system just to give me an idea of where the market is headed or to phrase that, rephrase that, to determine whether I'm on the right side of the market. So again, there will be whipsaws and there will be drawdowns, especially to open profits. So that's what I was saying a minute ago. Let's say you're in a longer term trend doing this, market corrects, you're going to have your drawdown or your equity curve is gonna look just like the market, obviously. And there will be drawdowns to open profits. And in the end, you're going to give up some of that trend. But if you're if you got in here and you got out there, then you did pretty good. You got to forget about this. And one thing that I wanted to mention earlier, I think it was Dennis, Richard Dennis, when they the turtles were talking about how Dennis felt about open drawdowns. And this is from the way of the turtle. As I've said before, I swore I would never read those turtle books until Larry McMillan said, it's actually a pretty good read. You should read it. So I did. And he was right. So the Curtis Faith, that's the only one I read. I refuse to read any more of them unless someone I respect like Larry tells me to read another one. But anyway, long story endless, Curtis Faith said that Dennis didn't really have a problem with drawdowns to open profits because it comes with the territory. So like any trend following system, you're going to have drawdowns, and that's especially true with open profits. Now, one thing you have to realize is you still want to be prudent, especially on individual issues. In 2015, we started getting stopped out of our longs, even though we didn't really have a major sell signal just yet in the market. And then eventually we had, I think it was a weekly bow tie in 2015, and that one didn't materialize. That one turned out to be a bit of a whipsaw. But like I said earlier, the Russell 2000 lost 18% from a weekly bow tie, and the media defines a bear market as a 20% loss. So for all intents and purposes, the Russell 2000 was actually in a bear market after that bow tie. So it's probably not a bad idea to get out of its way. Now, I'm not saying if you get a major sell signal in the indices, rush out and sell all your stocks. But what I am saying is make sure you honor your stops on your positions and maybe become a little bit less bullish on initiating new positions. You are going to have to have a position that looks really, really, really good when the market begins to weaken like that. So stay prudent and honor your stops. How would you use this system to sell short, i.e. the rules you have for going long? No, I would just use this. I would use now I, I, I would use your sell signal, your exit signal, as your short signal and I think if you waited for the daylight then it might get you in a little bit later but you could certainly add in that that daylight filter to the downside now maybe I'm curve fitting a little bit by that but we know in general that once a market begins to slide even though a top is a bit of a process often as opposed to an event but once the market begins to slide in earnest, the fear really piles into the market and the market begins to implode. Again, they slide faster than they glide. So I would use the sell short. I would just use the sell as a stop and reverse type of signal if you were going to short with this. But yes, of course, you could also put the same rules to the downside.
Now, just looking at the current market conditions real quick, we did touch the 50-week moving average earlier this year. And this little indicator here is just counting the number of days that we are above that or the lows are above that. In other words, upside Dave light. And so far, so good. And as you can see, now this is a couple of weeks old. But so far, so good. We're pretty, if I could draw a straight line, we're pretty close to those all-time highs. I'll do it when I get to the next charts. All right. Any questions? Have you tested the system on any other indices? Uh, no, I haven't. But I would be willing to bet it probably works in a similar fashion. And it might work. In other markets, and the thing about other markets is other markets tend to trend a little bit better than the indices. The indices tend to be a little choppy. Now, I've reduced some of that chop by looking at weekly charts only on this. And that's another one of those things I've learned very early in my system testing is I can make a system work in coffee or soy, even soybeans, which are pretty choppy, in quite a few other markets. But I couldn't make systems work, trend following systems, shorter term at least, let's say on a daily chart. I should let me rewind that. I couldn't make intermediate term daily signals work in something like the S&P 500. You can make a very short term system work, a choppy market system work, because as a general statement, indices are a very, very, very choppy market. So I learned early on it was very hard to trend follow in those markets. And I saw some trader years and years ago said, well, just buy everybody should just own one S&P future forever, which worked pretty good until it didn't, okay? But yeah, anything simple and trend following in nature should work in any markets that trend. All right, any other questions on this? Anything I may have overlooked? Okay, real quick, and you guys wanna start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Before we jump into the actual charts, I just want to show you this learning management system. I know I've been showing you for the last couple of weeks. I think we're getting a little closer on this. I went in and I'm redoing a lot of the videos and editing them and putting them in a better, more robust format. But it's going to be pretty cool if I say so myself. And one of the problems, as I often say, is people will ask me for help, and I'm not sure where they are. And by putting this learning management system in place, let's say they're asking me a lot of questions on TKOs or IPOs or something like that. Well, I can come in here and look and say, okay, well, they're nearly done with the methodology. So one or two things has happened. I've done a poor job of presenting the information. So maybe I should go in and add some more lessons, or maybe they just haven't finished all the lessons. As I've said before, and I know I'm sick of me telling the story, but I had somebody email me for 10 years and they, and they lost money trading for 10 years. And I really thought this guy was mentally challenged. I guess it's politically incorrect for me to call him what I would like to call him. But, you know, you mentally challenged, you mentally challenged. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. That's just, you know, it is what it is. And I felt sorry for the guy. And finally, I said, look, you just gonna go in and read my first book, read it again carefully because i talked about these concepts way back then 10 years ago and he said i've been meaning to get that so he didn't put any sweat equity into any of this and he was depending on me to give him information to help him along so this way i'll still help you but at least i could see where you are and this is a much better way of doing things a much more efficient way and then with time, there's going to be bonuses that you can unlock, such as a 911 call. And the longer you stay a member, the more 911 calls you'll get. And I'll do a little one on one consulting with you. And again, the longer you stay a member, the longer the consulting you'll get. But for the most part, all the information should be in here. And if it's not, and you have questions, there's going to be question and answer sections. And so, again, in time, you'll unlock more and more of the content. And you'll, I'm sorry, in time, you'll unlock more and more goodies. Now, you will, 
have, if you go to like the trading courses, let's see if I can find them. You will have access to all of the members courses in the members area. So, and as soon as you, you just have to take a small little intro course just to get you up to speed on a few little simple items. And then once you do that, you'll have access to all of the members courses. And in time, you'll also be able to unlock those premium courses. So I'm a nerd, but I'm pretty darn excited about this. And I think a learning management system is the way to go. And I think it's like something like 98% of all, or I'm sorry, 92% of all online courses are never finished. And I've got a lot of little things in here to help to make sure that you do get through these courses. All right, let's take a look at the P's. Well, first of all, where are the all-time highs? So if we take a look at all-time highs are right here. Where are we now? Well, we're somewhere near C, right? And if we take a look at the measurement on that, even though we're a little soft today, we are right about a half a percent, a little bit more away from all-time highs. So what I would suggest is to continue to err on the side of longer-term trend. Yes, on your stops on individual positions, but don't put on a lot of shorts right now. But Dave, it looks like a double top. Well, it could be, but we won't know that until after the fact. And it would make sense that we could hit a little resistance as we push into those old highs. But the other thing, the other way of thinking, too, is that new highs could be get more new highs because what's going to happen is there's going to be a fear of missing out. And people who did not buy prior to those highs will have to put up or shut up. So S&P 500 looking pretty good. Yes, on a weekly basis, a little bit more obvious. We are bumping up against that previous top in here. But I don't see any reason to get too excited just yet. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ is stuck in a sideways range. If you don't know anything about technical analysis, just draw a line. And you can see that we haven't really gone anywhere in two and a half, I'm sorry, two months. Okay, So we are stuck in a bit of a sideways range. But look at this. We just hit some new highs not that long ago. And we're only, what, about three-quarters of a percent away from those highs. So what's the whole lecture today on? Air on the side of long-term trend. If you're within, let's say, 10% of the all-time highs, or in the case we just showed, the 50-week highs, then stay long. Or certainly don't get aggressive on the short side. Now, again, if you get stopped out of position, you stopped out of position. Cuss and fuss and then move on. That's what I do. Russell 2000 broke out two days ago, closed at all-time highs just yesterday, giving it up a little bit today. The only thing that concerns me about the Russell has been this stupid sideways action we've been seeing forever. But now, today notwithstanding, this morning notwithstanding, it's trying to break out. You know me. Ideally, I'd like to see it break out and not look back for a long, 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 long time. Now, as far as the sectors, some of these weaker areas have been improving a little bit as of late, such as energies. Energies still look pretty ugly, wide and loose and sideways, still look like a top, but they've been improving as of late. Metals and mining, not so much, though. Metals and mining in a pretty serious downtrend, and you can see beginning to sell off in here a little bit, so they're looking pretty ugly. Some kind of boring areas like consumer non-durables, as you can see, you're recently breaking out, looking better in here. Manufacturing is kind of wide and loose, but towards the top of its range. Retail breaking out to brand new highs, continuing to bang out new highs. That looks pretty good. Transports were kind of wide and loose, but then what happened? Well, they started getting close to their prior highs in here. Okay, they're at B now. Will they make it to C? Don't know, but... So far, so good as far as a recent comeback. Hardware, new highs. Software, trying to get back to its old highs in here. A little wide and loose and sideways. The point I'm trying to make is not all sectors look fantastic, but as a general statement, most look okay 
and are sideways at worst, with just a few exceptions, such as the metals and mining stocks, which are headed lower. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. The good news about bonds is they have been headed higher as of late. We've been stuck in this range, but for now, we don't have to worry about rates, at least in the long end. I know there's some concern about the shorter end of the curve going higher. But Dave, what about an inverted yield curve? Well, I'm not going to worry about that until it happens. In fact, I'm not going to worry about it until the market tells me to worry about it. So if we get, let's say, more than 10% away from those, those all-time highs, which are also the 50-week highs, then maybe I need to worry about the overall market. There's always something to worry about. And if you look at everything there is to worry about, you probably would never make a trade. A lot of these, uh, what's the foreign shares? Is it IFA? These foreign shares haven't been doing so hot in here. As you can see, big blue arrow pointing down in these areas. So I wouldn't rush out and buy any foreign stocks right now. So far, the United States is doing pretty darn good. Okay, question is ARLO. Um, I would like to see a little bit more range on something like this, but it's not bad. 1850 to 20-something and change. And you can see that the high was set on the first day of trading. So, and the, but since the price is above $20 a share, which is the rule for the buy at D pattern for IPOs, if you want it to be less than that, what I would do is I would add in a five-day moving average. And I don't have a name for this system yet, but we're looking for a one day of daylight, Dave Light, I should say, and a close above this high. So this would have to close, let's just say 22 and three quarters would have to be the close. And then you'd also have to have Dave Light. I think that would be an okay trade. I think you could probably do a little better, but I can't argue with it as far as trading with the trend and playing an IPO breakout. T L R Y. Yeah, this is one that was on the Landry list not that long ago and turned out to uh, had a pretty good, have a pretty good run in it. It looks pretty good. It's had a pretty serious – let's just measure this run here. Let's see. It was uh, – yeah, it's 64%. I'd like to see it pull back a little bit now and maybe just treat it like more of a generic core methodology setup. But, yeah, put that on your momentum list. Possibly on a pullback it might be worth a shot. Anybody else want to talk about anything else? That's it. All right. So no, so no, I like. Um, so no, might be my new Lulu Lemon though. I did not take this trade. And one thing that I say with IPOs is, what's the story, fad or glory? Now, sometimes a fad like Lulu Lemon can take off. And I remember seeing a beautiful setup, a secondary setup, meaning like a pullback, a trend resumption type of pattern in um, Lulu. And I didn't take it. I made fun of them because they made yoga clothes, what turned out to be a great setup. But something like Sonos, they just make speakers. And I'm having a hard time getting excited about it. Now, I will admit, a couple days ago, I'm like, damn, why did I buy it? But you have to be willing to walk away and be okay in your analysis so in this particular case, I'm like, well, they just make speakers, so maybe wait for a secondary signal. In other words, by secondary signal, why not let them – let me see if I can get a blank chart up here. So in the IPOs, you have what I call pioneer signals, and you have secondary. Sometimes I call them primary signals too. So I have a couple little patterns that might get you early, I'm sorry, long early on, one, two, three, four, five, as early as the close of this day, the fifth day, one week of trading. And in some cases, what I like to do is, in a case like Sonos, because it's hard for me to wrap my head around getting excited about a speaker company, what I'll do is say, well, let's just take a secondary signal. So a primary signal would have been here or pioneer signal. I'll use those two terms interchangeably. And a secondary signal would be, okay, let's see if it has a decent trend in it, kind of like that TLRY, and let's look to play that pullback. So put that on your momentum list, but I would prefer 
in that particular case, to take a stock like that on a secondary type of signal. So if it begins to trend nicely, breaks out new highs, continues to trend, look to play your next pullback. BJ. BJ is kind of interesting in here. It did take off. It did pull back. Let's get the moving average out of there. Um, it looks okay, but now I wouldn't play that secondary breakout. What I would do here is I would let it break out, see if it can break out, and then look to play maybe the first pullback along the way. So put that in your momentum list. But I don't see a setup there right now. All right, any other stocks? Any other setups you guys want to look at? Feel free to ask. I won't bite, I promise. If you're new to the presentation, the stock isn't trending, I'll just explain to you that it's not trending. Like one guy, I've been coming to your presentation for eight months, and you never like one of my stocks. Like, well, pick better stocks. <laughs> what was that um, movie, Jim Carrey? We're liar, liar, we, we had to tell the truth. <laughs> Bob knocked over another ATM. He wants to know what to do. Stop breaking the law. All right, Joe wants to know about home. Um, I don't like it. It's not jumping out at me. It's something I would like because if you look at it shorter term, we probably put a bow tie on here. It might show you what's going on. Yeah, you've got a it kind of bow tie down, a little sloppy, but first thing I'm seeing is, one, a gap down after brand new highs. Not a big fan of that. I have actually has a, have a pattern that short stocks when that happens. And then two, if you look at the net net price movement, it's headed fairly lower for a while here. And now it's trying to claw its way back up. But if you look at the net net a little bit longer term, you can see we've got four months of sideways action. So I would pass on this one unless it goes on to make new highs and continues higher. So I would actually wait to excuse me, wait to see if it could break up the new highs and then look play pullbacks along the way. Docu for Peter. Um, if you're not already long, you had this little pullback back here, okay? And it kind of meandered sideways. We were watching it back here. I think we gave up because it started going sideways. If you're not already long, then wait to see if it breaks out the new highs and then look to play pullbacks along the way. If you are long, then stay long. Starbucks, I'm probably not going to like, but let's take a look at it anyway. Um, first thing I'm seeing here is you've got a big mound of overhead supply. Now, as I often say, there's nothing that's that technical about technical analysis, at least the way I do it. And when I take look at a stock like this, it's like, well, wait a minute. Yes, it's been headed higher as of late, but you've got a big gap down here, probably on earnings or something. And then you've got this mountain of overhead supply. So anybody who bought the stock, let's say 56-ish or higher, is going to look at, to get out of break even. So even if you did capture a move back into that overhead supply, then that would likely cap your trade. Now, you want to make sure you have the potential for unlimited gains on every trade because sooner or later you're going to get whacked pretty hard either on a trade in and of itself or a number of trades together. So I would hold off on that one. And keep in mind that this is a very thick, thick, thick stock, meaning high share volume, high capitaliz capitalization, excuse me. Um, it's something that I w maybe on the short side, I look at something like this, but I prefer something a little bit more exciting and a little bit thinner and a lot more inefficient than something like this. Starbuck probably has 500 analysts and 1,000 or 2,000 funds that owned it, own it. Okay, PS for Phil. That's a, PS is one that was on the Landry list for quite a while. This is a, another one of those IPOs. It looked pretty good back here. It, it's it's kind of like the one we looked at a little while ago where you had a really nice pullback and it never materialized, and then it began to finally take off. What I would do here is I would see if it could actually extend this rally higher and then look to play pullbacks along the way. So you're now in a secondary type of signal, but definitely not a new buy signal on that one. But, yeah, worth putting on your watch list. You're welcome. 
Twitter for Phil, TWTR. No, unless you want to short it. Uh, I don't like this big gap down here, okay? And then you kind of just go on sideways. Now, sometimes after a gap down like that, you have a, a shorting opportunity, but so far it's just going to crawl higher. Also, a big thick stock. Look at the volume on this thing. I would avoid that. You said short. Well, yeah, maybe I, I personally wouldn't short it, but I hear you. Um, it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. I mean, if I was forced to trade this long or short, I would say short, but I would leave it alone just because it looks like it's uh, the damage is already done and now it's just kind of chopping around. Ken for Donald. Zach, you're next. Zachary. Uh, this is one I've been watching here and there. It's a little on the thin side. Uh, it could use a little bit more momentum. It looks okay. Maybe on a little bit deeper pullback. But definitely put it on your momentum list. And just keep in mind that it is a little thin. Goose for Zach. Uh, no. First thing I see here is the net-net price movement. Let's measure that. It's headed lower, 21% lower over the last, what, couple of months. Uh, the Your whole move was in this first, was in this gap higher, and then it only continued higher for like a bar or two or three. So I like to see a trend do this and then do this as opposed to do this and then do that, okay? You want to see it accelerate higher. And you want to see that acceleration continue higher. So I would pass on this one. Okay, T-R-H-C, T-R-H-C. Yeah, put this in your momentum list. Look at this nice persistent move higher. So, yeah, on pullbacks, that might be worth a shot. Definitely make sure that's in your momentum list. T-R-H-C. Yes, we just did that one. So, yeah, it's a couple of people asking about this particular stock. Good eyes for those who saw that one. Yeah, on a pullback, maybe. Nice persistent trend higher. Keep an eye out for pullbacks. All right, any more questions? Any more stocks? Okay. Well, while we're at an impasse, I obviously want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. And we have one or two more coming in last minutes. Uh, TDM, TNDM. It's another one of those momentum stocks uh, on pullbacks, possibly. My only concern here, it's had such a great run that it might have um, the excitement might be off of it. Okay, it is, there is some longer term resistance. I guess that'd be a good problem to have. Uh, maybe on pullbacks, put it on your momentum list, but right now it's not set up. If you're long, stay long. All right, once again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Any unanswered questions, daviddavelandry.com. Keep an eye out for that learning management system. I hope to get it launched within about a month or so. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a great weekend. And then I guess uh, hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next Thursday. Thank you so much.